This time on the Highland Woodworker, we're headed to wood artist Scott Thompson's rustic workshop to get the lowdown on the boldest high boy project I've ever seen. Stop pulling your hair out from the hand plane tear out. A quick tip from popular woodworking's Megan Fitzpatrick will give you the edge. The earliest thing that I can remember is sitting in my house and my dad walks in the door and says, uh, would you be interested in woodworking? Meet Jalen Wagoner, an aspiring furniture maker who is turning heads already with his masterpieces and he's still in high school. I've got some designs in my head that I'd like to get out. Spend a moment with master period furniture maker Glenn Huey, the man who seems to have perfected the past and now is looking to the future. All of this and more this time on the Highland Woodwork. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia for all my fine woodworking tools. Hello, Ed Scent. Hey Chuck, good to see you again. Nice to see you. Ed, I've started working with some uh, 9, 10, 11 inch boards. I need to be able to plane and joint those, and I only have an eight inch joiner. Well, I think we can help you. Rycon makes a joiner planer. Uh, we'll handle boards up to 12 inches wide for you. That sounds great, but first, my friend, Scott Thompson, is building a replica of Samuel McIntyre's beautiful mahogany chest on chest. Well, Scott, this is Marabone Hills, right? <laughs> you are in the Marabone Hills right now. It's named after Big Marabone Creek and Little Marabone Creek that come together, and uh, you're right in the middle of it. What a beautiful place. Yeah. And you've got kind of everything that you need to, to establish life here. We do. The, the woodworking business sort of fits into a vision of growing a family. And so we have chickens and fresh eggs and goats and fresh milk. And wow. Uh, we harvest some of the trees, uh, turn them into boards, let them dry, and then we make, make furniture and cabinets out of them. You've got a, a residence here with a log cabin and, mm -hmm. and beautiful stone building attached to yep, it as part yep. of your house. A little addition we made. And, um, for, as our family grew, we, we uh, added on a little bit. And then a shop down here that's 100 feet from the house. Well, I can see this is where I'm going to feel at home. Come on in. Make yourself at home. All right. Well, let's see what's here. When I designed the shop, I, I didn't think about, I did think about the machinery. I just didn't think about the wood. And so it's always been a little crowded. I wish I'd had a little more space for, for what we're working on. But No shop is ever big enough. I know. If you had a football field. True. You could but fill it up. What in the world is La Dura Dura? This is, uh, our family loves rock climbing and uh, camping and adventure in general. And La Dura Dura was the hardest rock climb. It had never been completed until about a year ago. Um, some top climbers in the world set it up, but La Dura means the hard. And uh, the guy that was setting it up would, would call it that. And then finally someone said, there's lots of hard climbs. What, what's, what, which one are you talking about? He says, La Dura Dura, like the hard, the hard. And so I've named this project La Dura Dura because it just has every element of woodworking in it. It has carving, uh, turning, uh, carving on turnings, uh, dovetails, sliding dovetails, uh, just anything you can think of. So I'd love to show you a few more details. We borrowed pretty heavily from the McIntyre piece and um, another piece that's a lot like it. And But we also added our own... Um, details and elements and I'm really trying to tell you know tell a story this is a family's uh, the husband wants to give this to his wife as a wedding gift an anniversary gift um, it's going to have a lot of secret drawers in it and um, he wants to have things in those secret drawers he doesn't even want her to know where all of them are to begin with and kind of let her discover some of those well, Scott, I just love the ebony details on these beautiful feet. Yeah. Tell us about it. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, I love the idea of the pad as a, at the very bottom of the feet. Ebony is so hard and so tough that we hope over the long term that that lasts years and years and years. And then this, the little element here that's circular is actually an inverted torque. And we wanted to bring that, that detail down into the feet. 
um, it's going to be in the upper part of the upper carcass. And that's a lot of carving in that to get that to follow this cant here, and then that flows from the serpentine front. The idea of veneer was not something that the client, uh, that my friend and client really wanted to do. And so the whole thing is, is solid mahogany, um, except we did for the serpentine front, I'll open this. Uh, we did a brick laid core, which is traditionally how they would have done this in the 1700s. And uh, coming across, right, that, that allows you to compensate for any short grain. Um, because if it was just a big thick piece of wood that you band sawed out, you'd always have some short grain. You can see it in the top element here. That, that little piece there would be the weak point. But a brick laid core compensates for that. Then we band sawed that out and then made our own veneer. So there's a nice piece of mahogany beer on the, on the back. And then this is highly figured. This is pretty rare. Uh, Honduran mahogany that's uh, it's fiddleback actually kind of like the maple and it's every once in a while shows up in uh, in mahogany and when we get finished on that it'll really pop that's beautiful yes uh, and what kind of finish do you we will probably do a traditional uh, shellac French polish um, with this and this piece here is that the waste this is the waste yeah uh, this separating the lower carcass and the upper carcass um, this is really just roughed out. These dovetails aren't even glued yet, but this is half line dovetails on this. Um, I'll take this back off and you can see, I won't take it off right now, but I can scoot it back, that um, the waste here is technically hollow. And at this, at some point, um, fairly soon hopefully, this will pull out and as a drawer, and uh, sort of as a hidden drawer, and then in here, as we pull this out, there'll be a map of, uh, I think, the Greek island where they went on their honeymoon. Um, so it's an island off the coast of Greece. Uh, that's an example of, of secret drawers. I'm not going to show all of them to you, though. No, you never want to show all your drawers. <laughs> I, I learned that very early. Now, I see some uh, penciled in... Uh, lettering here yeah. and it's something I can't read so you know, yeah. tell me about that this is pulling from uh, uh, Greece as well um, this is sort of New Testament era Greek and we took a poem by John Keats uh, ode on a Grecian urn that he he wrote when he was actually looking at an original Greek vase and uh, uh, we feel like we sort of brought it full circle um, we had it translated, it's obviously English, he was English poet, and we, we translated it into Greek. But we want to use this as tracery, kind of like the elements here on the cant, um, where it's just carved and, you know, it's a really nice detail. So when you walk in the room, we want this to read as tracery. Are you going to show us how you do it? I'd be happy to. <laughs> the trick here with, with uh, carving these letters is owning the right gouges. Um, each of these shapes with these curves, if you can match the gouge directly to that, then you can accomplish that. And that, see, that's a little bit too wide. I need to tighten up that. So that's a number six there. I'm gonna need about a number seven or number eight. Uh, there's a seven. And so I'm just trying to, to match that gouge to that profile there. I see. And then, and then just work it out. Let me see what we can. So as I'm going, I'm, I'm, uh, anytime you're carving, you got to be thinking about grain. And uh, usually, uh, if a number seven works this way, I'll switch to a number eight coming back this way because that's actually going to be a tighter radius. Sure. When I've turned over, um, that seven is is a little too tight. I think I'm going to go back to that six and see if I can get it to work. But this, um, I'm having a feeling the seven's gonna be great on the, on the back side there. Let's see what this, the six will come in and, and relieve that. All right, coming back this way. And then I've, I've also found as I get down in there, I um, sometimes the 
the angle is constantly changing. And um, that tighter gouge actually will finish it out. But I, the goal is always to have really crisp lines. And um, I can even move the, this light here. And as the shadow catches that, I think that's one of the most interesting things about the, the uh, letter carving there. Um, and actually any carving, but when, when the shadow catches it and when the light you know, comes across there uh, and shows those, those little, little lines there um, and coming down to really crest points. Well, Scott, with every great project, uh, especially the one you're doing, it deserves a great piece of wood and wow. Yeah. This is some wonderful mahogany. Yeah. I know there's a story behind this. Yeah, yeah, there is. This board was uh, came from a tree that was blown down in Hurricane Mitch in Belize uh, during uh, 1998. And we found out about it through Hearn Hardwoods and just purchased a good part of the tree for the project. Um, it has a, you know, there are some elements to mahogany where we really have sort of stolen the wood um, from different parts of the world. And I, I want to be careful not to participate in that, but this one was was harvested after it had been blown down in the hurricane. And we had permission from the government and bought it from there. It got held up in customs for about three years, stayed, stayed um, in Belize, and then finally got up to Hearn Hardwoods south of Philadelphia. You've got some nice material over here for rails and styles. Sure, sure. That's quarter sawn even. Right, we could pull from, from different, because we've got the whole board, we can, we can select what pieces are appropriate for uh, what parts. And I do like that a lot. I'm really thankful for, for um, having great materials and you know, a client that wanted to invest in really great materials. So. Well, this is a winner. Thank you so much, Oh, Scott. thanks for coming. Great to have you. Come back anytime. <laughs> Chuck, this is the Rikon joiner planer I was telling you about. It's got the 12 inches capacity and it has a fence, of course, for joining the edge. But I, what I really like about it is the fact that you can take your wider stock you get from the lumber yard, get it nice and flat, then you can plane it to have perfectly parallel sided material, which for building makes it a lot easier. That's what I need to be able to do. And I think I'm interested in what they call helical heads. Brycon does have a model that has a helical head. We had a couple in stock, but we run out of them. They're real popular. When you get some in, can you put my name on the list? Sure, we'll let you know as soon as they come in. All right, that sounds great. Coming up, Popular Woodworking's Megan Fitzpatrick shows us a simple way to put an end to hand plane tear out. It's attitude. If you know you can do it, you can do it. Period furniture maker, author, and magazine editor, Glenn Huey, invites us into his Cincinnati shop and does something on the joiner that, well, you'll just have to see it to believe it. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Put a saw stop in your shop. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry leading band saws like their new powerful 10 350 14 inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Bell Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. 
I help develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Forest, manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker II presents the PVW Blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. When it comes to hand planes, tear out is something you never want. Our friend Megan Fitzpatrick shows a simple foolproof way of keeping your hand plane in tip top shape. This time on Popular Woodworking Magazine's Tips, Tricks and Techniques. Megan, plane setup is so important and I'd like to be able to reduce tear out and, and be able to, to get all I need out of my hand planes. Have you got some ideas for me? Well, one thing that you can do is set your chip breaker really close to the edge of your plane blade. And Rhett Fulkerson, who's a plane maker in Frankfort, Kentucky, showed us this trick when he was here in the shop a few weeks ago. And it's really almost foolproof and it's quick and it's easy and I recommend it to anybody who needs to set up their plane with the chip breaker close to the edge. So why don't I show you? All right, let's all right. get close to the edge. Okay, so I've got my number three here, which I like to use um, for smoothing. And what I want to do is set the chip breaker closer to the cutting edge here. Yeah. So I'm just going to take a feeler gauge and a flat surface, and I'm going to tape the feeler gauge down on the wood here. And just make sure your piece is really flat. And this is so simple. You're just going to loosen the screw here. Now I'm going to take the sharp cutting edge here, at least I hope it's sharp, <laughs> and uh, press it up against the back of the uh, feeler gauge here. And I've got a 0 .007, a 7 thou feeler gauge here. You can go down to as thin as uh, 5 thou or so. Much closer than that, you might be causing yourself more trouble than uh -huh. good, though. So I am just going to press the edge of the cutting uh, the blade here up against the edge of the chip breaker and just drop the chip breaker. I need to loosen that a little more. Drop the chip breaker down onto the feeler gauge. And if I have a camber in my blade, which I do here, I want to press in the middle to make sure I have it mating uh, parallel to the highest point on the edge. And then I just tighten the screw back down and that's it and you're done. So you're going to get the setting you want with a perfectly parallel edge every time. And having that chip breaker up near the front is going to help you reduce tear out. So you don't have to hold it in the air and right, kind of guess. Right. And, and until Rhett and showed, showed us this, I was always holding it up and trying to guess and feeling side to side, yeah. making sure it was parallel. But this really makes it so quick, so Perfectly fast, referenced. Perfectly referenced every time. every time. That's great. I can't wait to get back to my shop and try this on my planes. Great. Thank you, Megan. Sure. Jalen Wagner is 16 years old and is a master in the making. While most kids his age are building dioramas for their school projects, this Indiana boy is in the shop building exquisite furniture for his. I can't wait for you to meet him this time on Generation Next. My name is Jalen Wagner and I'm from Frankfurt, Indiana. Earliest thing that I can remember is sitting in my house and my dad walks in the door and says, uh, would you be interested in woodworking? Like, we could start, we could start woodworking. And I said, sure. 
after that, he bought a lathe, and then we started lathing, and of course, it's fun. And after that, like we, we just did lily based stuff, like making vases and stuff like that. And then my school had a Valentine's Day box um, competition, and we decided like we, we would like to do something out of wood. And so we decided to make a Pinocchio. His head was, was laid along with his nose. Everything else was just uh, poplar construction, two by fours. My first big project was my Blacker House dining chair. Um, we started on it when I was 13 and, and I actually turned 14 while we were working on it. And that, that was very eye-opening to us. We couldn't find any plans online, so most of it we drew ourselves on poster board and just went with what we thought looked correct. The Blacker House chair had to be all square, yet rounded, yet curved. And then the Maloof chair, that one had to, you just kind of put it together and then went from there. Just carved it however you thought it would look and match up on both sides. And just whatever felt right while you were working on it. But they were both a ton of fun to work on. I would probably say the middle of the project is probably my favorite part. It's, it's the part where you have the material in your hands and you can just think in your mind where can it go from now. As far as social life, it ends, ends up my dad and I in the shop most of the day after school while we're working on the projects. It's when my friends see the projects that I make, they, they're not quite sure what, what to think because they, they can look at it and feel it, but they don't quite understand all that went into it unless, unless uh, we take them aside and show them like the shop and, and explain all that went on in creating the project. My dad has definitely spent a lot of time and effort into us going to places like um, we're working in America to meet these professionals and craftsmen who have spent years perfecting their craft and just spending one-on-one -on -one time with them, asking them and just give, giving us advice as far as what, sh what we should do with these projects that we've been doing. We found this project um, while doing the research for my, for my first chair, the Blacker House chair. We went to several websites and a lot of people that made these chairs also created um, the, the table that went along with it. And so we got to looking at that and we were thinking, oh, let's, let's maybe not do a chair this year. While they're fun and all, like, let's, let's try something else. And so we decided to go with a gaming table is what they call it and it has a checkerboard built into the top of it, it has drawers to pull out with all the separate pieces, and it very nicely complements the uh, Blacker House chair. My, my biggest inspiration in all, all of these projects right now, I would have to say hands down, would be my father. Um, he's, he's the one that, uh, that really gets the ball rolling every year and starts helping me with research and looking into these projects and starting from scratch with Poplar and seeing what we can create before we start the actual projects, but it's, I would definitely say it would have to be him. When I grow up, I've been looking into nursing and looking into college degrees and what I can do now while I'm in high school, but um, as far as woodworking goes, I know it'll, it'll always be a hobby, but as far as going into, into it professionally, I, I'm still undecided as, as of yet. But it's, I've always said that it's always a possibility. And he looked at me and started laughing. He said, would you like to write some articles for us? And I said, absolutely, love to write articles for the magazine. Hear what master furniture maker Glenn Huey told a popular magazine editor that completely changed the course of his work. You're watching The Highland Woodwork.
Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly, providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Put a saw stop in your shop. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. Glenn Huey has provided our show with some great tips and tricks in the past. This master period furniture maker invited us into his Cincinnati workshop where he opens up about his life, his work, and of course, another great tip. Yeah, I always tell people I'm a woodworker who happens to write a little bit. Glenn Huey is a popular name as a magazine editor and his furniture masterpieces will transport you back in time hundreds of years. I'm okay being a period furniture guy. That's uh, that's kind of where my heart is. But we only have to turn the clock back roughly 40 years to hear this master woodworker's humble beginnings. I moved right in when dad got the tools and and, uh, and pestered him until he finally set me up at the lathe and said go ahead and, and turn. And so I started at the lathe turn and he gave me a gouge and, and showed me the process and uh, he did a lot of it, but uh, he turned me loose at the end, and I would turn, and as I always laugh, and I say, I turn a bowl, and then I turn another bowl, and I turn another bowl, and pretty soon I went to Dad, and I said, look, I've obviously at 13, I've mastered turning at a bowl, so I'd like to have something bigger to do. And it was funny, as at the time, you go back to the, oh, mid-70s or so, there weren't a lot of woodworking books out, and the ones he had were the, the books by Franklin Gotchell. And if you're familiar with those books, there's not a lot of simple projects in those books. So he told me, he said, find a project that you want to try and, you know, show it to me. So I sat down and went through all the different books. And finally, I got to this Sheridan Field bed because it's turning. And I've mastered turning at 13, so, you know, well, that should be easy. So I took it to Dad and I said, so here's what I want to build. And he kind of smiled and said, you know, if that's what you want to try, we'll go ahead and do it. And so we, uh, we went up to the lumber yard. We had a lumber yard, hey, 30, 40 minutes from us, a little place in it. Uh, we went in and got lumber, and he was getting ready to do a, a low boy. His first major project was a low boy. My first major project was a Sheridan field bed. So I guess, you know, you, you might as well jump into the deep water <laughs> and get started. And so we bought the lumber, and uh, I always remember that the, the guy asked me, he said, uh, so what are, you, what are you doing with these? And, you know, at 13, I put my hands on my shoulders and, or my chest, and I said, well, I'm going to build a Sheridan field bed. And you could just see the guy smile, thinking, well, there's a lot of sawdust, you know, so. But it worked out, and I, I still have the bed today. Time marched on, and Glenn's interest in woodworking followed him to college at the University of Cincinnati. While there, he earned degrees in business and accounting, and quickly put that knowledge to work. My dad and younger brother and I decided we were going to do a woodworking business, and we checked into it, and we all agreed on it. The problem was I reached the decision before they did, so I started a company to do reproduction furniture. Well, about three weeks or four weeks later, they decided that they were going to start their business. And my younger brother come down and he asked me, he said, you know, is it okay? And I said, well, sure. I mean, you know, you guys want to have a separate business? That's fine. But I said, don't go to all the show promoters and, and lock up the area because we do very similar furniture. Well, the first thing he did was call all the show promoters. and locked up the area. So we had to work together and eventually we did. And, and the reason we put everything together is because my mom had had enough of the arguments and the talking back and forth and she put her foot down. And when mom put her foot down, we paid attention. Not long after that, Popular Woodworking Magazine took notice of Glenn's work. One or two of the first shows I was at was here in Cincinnati in the area and Popular Woodworking Magazine's based here. 
And the Monday after the show, I get a phone call from a guy named Steve Shaughnessy, who was the publisher. At that time, he was the editor of the magazine. And he said, we'd like to talk to you about your furniture. And I said, okay, great. And he said, what we want to talk to you about is you guys do a lot of work in Tiger Maple, and we're interested in how you finish Tiger Maple. And I said, well, sure, yeah, that's fine. And so Steve said, well, how do you do it? And I said, well, here's the deal. He said, I said, it's real simple, Steve. Instead of buying $3 a board foot lumber, you buy $10 a board foot lumber because better lumber's got more stripe in it and that's how you're gonna make it pop. And he looked at me and started laughing. He said, would you like to write some articles for us? And I said, absolutely, I'd love to write articles for the magazine. And that's how we got started. Glenn takes his accounts from years of working in his shop and shares those great tips and techniques in the scores of articles and the books he writes, all while still making beautiful classic period pieces like these. I was curious about the tools he liked to use most in creating such stunning work. 10 years ago, you were a woodworker. And then we got to the point where it's now, are you a power tool woodworker, or a hand tool woodworker? And where I really think people are is we're all hybrid tool workers. We all have to know the hand tools. We all need to have machines. And 99% of us do work that way. There's, there's the skirt on the outside that are all hand tools and the guys that are all power. I, I tell people that I am a, a hybrid woodworker that leans heavily towards the power tool side. I learned to do with the power tools what a lot of people are learning to do today with hand tools. What I'm about to show you with the joiner is going to make your eyebrows raise. I'll guarantee it. But there's a reason that I do it. And what I'm going to tell you I do is I set my knives so they're equal with each other, but they're out three thousandths of an inch from one side of the eight inch joiner knife to the other. And the reason is I'm getting a built-in spring joint when I run off of this joiner. So I said, it's possible for me since I've been fooling around with these tools so long that I do things with my power tools that most guys do with their hand tools. And that's one of the things that I really do. And I'll show you the whole process and explain it to you. I gotta see this. Yep, it's really different. All right, my All right. friend. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're doing. Yeah. At the back side, I set the knives three thousandths of an inch higher than I do at the front. Now, what that means is at the front, they're a little below my tables. At the back, they're a little above my tables. Right in the center, I've got that sweet spot that's almost perfect. So what happens is, if I have my fence out to the front edge, I'm going to get a real hard cup cut on it, where I'm going to, it's actually, as you push it across, it's going to raise up off of my outfeed table, and about halfway through, it's going to come down on that outfeed table. So it causes you to, to get that bow. Now that's sure. the extreme. That's a little too much. And I'm trying to take the bows out of the <laughs> edge. If you go to the back side of it and you set that up, you get just the opposite. It'll cut and give me this, this nice cup this way. So you find that point in the center where it just works for you. Where it comes away is I've got a nice little bit. I'm trying to get that business card, that playing card in the center of a spring joint. Once I achieve that, I can go ahead and clamp that with a single clamp on, on most up to 24 inch boards. And it saves me time all the way through. I gotta see it work. All right. All right. So we'll start right out the front because I want to run through and show you what happens. And as I'm cutting here, I'm going to use two boards that have a, a lot different colors so you can kind of see where we're at with this. Sure. All right. So the first one I'm going to cut, what happens as I turn this on is as I come across, you'll see it raise up off of the outfeed side. Now you notice I'll put my hand in the center sure. as almost a fulcrum point. So as I cross over the halfway center point, it drops the front down and raises the back up. That's giving me that cut. Because you have that one point. Right, yeah. right. And this is the extreme. I'm all the way out at one side. Take a little of this off. Yeah, cut a little too much of it off. All right, so let's pick it up here. See how we're doing here? We're totally raised up off of the bed. And remember now, this is an extreme. Then as I cross the halfway point, it brings that front down and raises the back side off. And then I can finish my cut all the way through. Right. So, I'm, so that balancing point gives you the arc. Right, that's where yeah. your center is. Now, I'm so far out 
that it's not really making the cut at this point. That's why you know you don't need to be out this far. If I lowered the depth of cut, I would be able to cut all the way through the board, but then I'd be taking too much. So I know out here I'm way too far out in front. So what I need to do is adjust this back to that sweet spot, which is generally going to be, you know, three to four inches back in the tool, because that's about the halfway point. Now I'm going to go ahead and take this and make this same cut over this piece. Now you'll see it raise up in the front, but you won't see it raise up much. And then you'll see it come all the way down, and I'm cutting clear through the cut. Now that was the first one we cut. It's a little harder to do. Let me cut this fresh board, and then we'll compare the two. Okay, even on your dead flat joiner bed right now, you can see the fact that we're tight back here at the back, we're tight up at the front, but you can even see right now that it's raising up off of that bed just a little as bit. That's right, and, and that's gonna make your spring joint. That, that's just what I need for that spring joint. So when I bring these two over and I put them down side by side, you can see what's going on. I'm tight at the ends, but I've got that gap in the center. And so now do you have to put a whole bunch of clamps on it, the front no. and back? And, and <laughs> you would think so with a gap that big. But this is where the spring joint really, really pays dividends. I can go and put glue on both sides of this, put one clamp in the dead center, pull this into where I get a little squeeze out, and after that I'm going to be tight on these two ends where one clamp's all I need to glue up this piece. Up to about 24 inches I can get by with one single clamp. Think of the time it saves. And the clamps. And the clamps it saves. Yeah, yeah. Th that's great. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I can't wait to try that one. Glenn just seems to have a way of figuring out challenges that we all face in the shop. His secret to success is attitude. One day I was working on that high boy, but I was working on an early version of it that I had sold to a customer. And I came into the shop one morning about 7 o'clock in the morning as I was getting started and I thought, I've got to dovetail all the drawers for that chest today. And what I figured was I was watching a couple shows where I had seen glass cutters and they were taking the, the cutter and just moving through the glass and snapping it right where it was supposed to be. And I thought, wow, just it's, it's an attitude. So I took that idea to the dovetails and I thought, I've been doing woodworking enough that I should be able to cut dovetails without a problem. It's crazy. They, there's no way that this should get the better of me. So I developed an attitude that I was going to cut dovetails that day. I was going to finish all drawers. There were 12 drawers. I was going to get them all done and walk home that night with the drawers finished. And I cut all 12 drawers that day, and they were the best dovetails that I ever cut. And my whole theory at that point is, it's attitude. If you know you can do it, you can do it. If you sit there and worry about it and wonder if it's going to happen, you're going to find mistakes in places that you, you make error. And so a lot of woodworking is just understanding what you're doing and putting it down to work and making it happen. This period woodworker will be using that same attitude to take on something, well, more modern. I'd like to go into a little bit more contemporary and I've got some designs in my head that I'd like to get out. And uh, before, you know, everything I was doing before period wise was because I had customers that that's, that's where I sold and that's what I was after. Today I'm pretty much building for myself so I can skate out there on some, on some thinner ice and see if I can uh, make it without cracking through. Glenn continues to make his mark in furniture making and on those fortunate enough to learn from this marvelous master woodworker. I enjoy working with people in woodworking, uh, giving them information. I love to see when you're working with somebody, the light bulb go off when they finally get what it is you're trying to, to put across to them. Teaching you, you know, you get that, especially one-on-one -on -one teaching, you know. It's uh, passing along woodworking, getting people involved in, and letting them know that part of it. Well, the big day is here. The Rikon 12-inch joiner planer combination has been delivered, set up, and ready to go. And I'm going to face joint this big, wide piece of walnut. <laughs> Let's see how it does.
Well, that's a tough board there with a big knot in it, but I want to tell you, you can almost see the shine. A great surface. Let's make it into a planer. Let's take the guard off. We're going to unlatch it. We're going to push the, the fence forward. Lock it down. Now let's lift this up. And move our dust collection up here. And now all we have to do is feed a board in here and the board will come out over there. Let's give it a try. Now that's a great surface. Those helical cutters do a wonderful job. I'm so proud to have this Rikon machine in my shop. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have left for this episode. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.